think we'll go ahead and get started. Do people hear me okay in the back? Excellent. Um, well, I want to say a big thank you uh, for everyone attending NDC. Uh, I think this is I think my fourth or fifth NDC conference that I've been able to, to do, and it's an amazing audience and an amazing event, and uh, it's a real privilege to be here and uh, be able to talk to you Friday morning uh, about what they asked me to talk about, which is the modern cloud, and kind of, you know, what, what do I think about in terms of some of the new trends that are happening in terms of cloud computing? And, you know, more importantly, like, how do, what are some of the opportunities for all of us in this room uh, to really build new types of apps, uh, not just sort of hopefully better code or better architecture than we've done in the past, but also just brand new scenarios and enable things that just weren't possible uh, before. And, you know, one of the things I often say when I talk uh, to developers at, at events like this is just, it's an amazing time to be a developer. You know, when you think about just the wealth of different technologies that are out there uh, that are emerging, uh, whether it's around IoT, whether it's around machine learning and AI, you know, whether it's around, you know, new types of hardware like FPGA and GPUs, uh, whether it's around new frameworks um, like con the container orchestration uh, with Kubernetes or uh, technologies um, that are emerging in terms of handling uh, large-scale systems like never before. It's, you know, it's, it's, I can't remember a time in the industry when there's just been so much innovation happening really at the same time. And you know, in many ways, cloud computing is helping really drive a lot of this innovation by making it much, much easier for all of us to really experiment with this technology without having to buy new servers or without having to kind of dedicate uh, a whole bunch of capacity. Uh, and um, it's driving a new level of scale and a new level of innovation that we all get to take advantage of. You know, at the same time, you know, the scary thing with all this new technology is it is overwhelming. Uh, and, you know, I think one of the important things to always keep in mind is, as a developer when you're approaching things like this is, you know, don't always try to learn all of it in one day uh, because, A, you can't. Uh, and, B, you know, try to find places where you can get bite-sized uh, chunks of value and, uh, you know, really learn and be able to build new apps and then continue along the way. And that's why events like this are so great to kind of get exposure and to really hear um, from others that are actually practicing uh, the technology and, and really learning about what's the art of the possible and then also what's the best practices to implement it. So what I thought I'd do is, uh, since we only have an hour here this morning, is talk about three of the trends that I'm particularly excited on this slide, uh, which is the trend around AI, uh, the trend around serverless, and then also the trend around data at planet scale, uh, that I think are three things that hopefully most people in this room are going to be able to take advantage of in some way, shape, or form uh, over the next year or two. Uh, and you know, again, hopefully uh, provide ways that we can not just write better code, but also do new types of things that we just couldn't do before. And rather than just talk esoterically about it, what I thought I'd do is actually show off some demos of kind of each of them in action, so you can also get a sense of the art of the possible of what you can do with it, uh, and hopefully have a little bit of fun with a couple of uh, fun and sometimes silly demos uh, throughout the day. So I'll talk um, first about artificial intelligence. How many people are doing stuff today with AI? Only three hands. I'm not sure if that's it's only three people or the coffee hasn't sunk in yet. But, uh, but um, yeah, I think everyone's heard about AI. And you know, I think one of the things that, you know, it seems like every day in the newspaper, there's something about how AI is going to replace this or kill us or kill that or do something. Um, and there's, you know, I'd say the buzz factor and the hype over AI you know, is pretty high, but there's also a lot of real truth in terms of what you can do with it. And, um, you know, I think increasingly the expectation as software developers is going to be how do we take and write software that when combined with data delivers much more intelligent experiences. And, um, you know, things that I think a lot of cloud vendors, including uh, my own, uh, are spending a lot of time on is both, you know, how do we provide some of the tools that allow you to build as a data scientist or someone who's a deeply immersed in AI, uh, new types of applications and be able to unlock new insight with your own custom algorithms. Uh, and so we're investing heavily in kind of building platform technologies that allow you to do that. But at the same time also, how do we just make it so that you can integrate AI much more seamlessly into every app that you build and that you don't have to be a data scientist, you don't have to be a machine learning expert in order to actually start to integrate intelligence in terms of the systems that you build uh, and make them a lot richer. And you know, having the combination of both being able to have rich platform that lets you go infinitely deep, but also a 
a set of pre-built models that we can all just take advantage of like we do today when we reference a library or framework in our language of choice uh, is a nice balance and hopefully means that AI can really be something that all of us can easily take advantage of. And so specifically, you know, one of the things that, that my team's uh, been focused on is these things we call our Azure Cognitive Services, uh, which are kind of, again, pre-built REST APIs that you can call uh, that have models behind them that have been pre-trained, so you don't have to be a data scientist, and it literally is like calling a method call or a REST call uh, in order to invoke it, and um, you know, really provide simple APIs that you can leverage and use as part of it. Uh, and I thought, you know, make it a little bit fun is maybe I should show off a couple of demos of the types of things that you can do, you know, again, just by integrating a little bit of AI into your applications, uh, and hopefully get across the fact that this is something that everyone uh, in this room can start taking advantage of now uh, as you start to build applications and solutions. So let's go ahead and flip over here. And um, again, what I thought I'd do is just try to make all these different trends real by showing off real code uh, and actually showing off some real solutions of how you can go ahead and use it. So what I'm, I'm actually gonna do for, um, not co uh, coincidentally, for all my demos is take advantage of Azure, uh, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, but the, you know, the meta concepts we're talking about, obviously you can do with other cloud platforms as well. Um, but this uh, capability to create sort of AI and cognitive services uh, is something that, again, you know, I think is something that we're trying to make super easy for everyone to take advantage of. And so what I'm doing here is I'm just inside the Azure Management Console, uh, which is just a browser-based experience. And one of the things you can do very quickly is just go ahead and say new, and I can, start, for example, create a new computer vision API or a face API or a text analytics API. And this just stands up an endpoint where I have a little security key that I can go ahead and in a REST call basically invoke to be able to take advantage of this pre-built API model that exists. And this is sort of a sample app that you can download of a couple sort of pre-built applications that you can leverage that kind of show off what all you can do as part of this. And the one I was gonna show here is uh, something called Real-Time Crowd Insights. And basically, this is uh, showing off kind of a simple AI algorithm. And so everything, so there's, there's a client app here that's running uh, on my laptop. It's using the webcam in my, in my laptop here. But it's doing all the AI in the cloud using this endpoint that I can stand up you know, in a few seconds. And you'll notice here, as I'm moving around, there's a rectangle around my face. This is basically taking advantage of face detection. And so you can feed any video or you can feed any image in and it'll basically identify all the people uh, in terms of the face inside the picture. And you'll notice here if I zoom in, ooh, that's so scary. Uh, <laughs> you know, it also will do basic kind of uh, identity detection. So it's, it's noticed I'm a male, uh, it thinks I'm, well, I'm aging in front of you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and it's, you know, they always say with AI is AI is not always uh, truth. AI is sort of, you know, trained statistical, um, analytics based on past data. And so, you know, it doesn't know who I am. This is a completely anonymous case right now. And so I've aged maybe, ooh, not a lot. Um, <laughs> but it gives you a rough approximate. I'm, I'm turning 43 in two weeks. So it's, you know, it's not too far off. And it's been able to think, you know, identify my gender. Uh, and then you'll notice it also has this thing on the right, which is sentiment detection. So right now it's neutral, if I'm happy. Oh, come on. Yeah, there you go, yeah. Uh, and if I'm sad, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so it's a basic sort of sentiment analysis and detection. And the cool thing here is this is just an API call, a REST call. Give us an image, we'll return back a rect of all the faces, or an array of rects of all the faces with you know, details about sort of the sentiment and the gender as part of it. Uh, and so it's something that, again, every app can take advantage of, whether it's a mobile app, whether it's a web app, whether it's something on the back end. You know, it's, what's also you know, nice about you know, some of these APIs and you know, some of the things you can do with them is, again, not, without having to be a data scientist, can you provide basic training uh, with your own data that you upload uh, that can make it richer? And so in this case here, you know, the other thing the API lets you do is actually um, pre-populate pictures of people uh, that you can then train the model to identify in terms of the feed that you provide. So in this case here, you can search uh, the internet here for pictures of me. Um, you can see here, that's me a long time ago with more hair. This is me with less hair four years ago. Um, I don't know where that is. Uh, you know, 
these are all, I think, about six or seven years ago. Uh, these are not me. I, I, I wish that was me. Uh, yeah. um, that looks like me in jail. Um, but anyway. Um, so anyways, so I'll just pick a few pictures here. These are literally random off the internet. This is always fun. Um, and it's basically uploading uh, these pictures uh, to this API. I can then go ahead and just say train, retrain the algorithm. And uh, now one of the things you'll notice is when I actually uh, do the face detection, it's now not just identifying that I'm a male in my age, but it's also being able to identify, oh, this is actually Scott Guthrie based on those images. And it's about 76% confidence. So you can see the percentage confidence that it has. And it is definitely on face rather than shirt color. Um, but uh, maybe it gives higher confidence if I zoom in. Um, um, and you know, again, these weren't pictures I took this morning. These were all, you know, in some cases, 10-year-old pictures. But there's enough about face structure that it's able to infer. And if it was obviously a more recent picture, the confidence interval would go way up. Uh, and no, it's definitely me. And so you think about when you use Instagram, you use Facebook, you upload a picture of an event, and it sort of pre-identifies your friends in the picture. Um, you know, that used to take. Facebook thousands of engineers uh, to be able to uh, train the models to do that. You know, the cool thing is this is now something that all of us with four or five method calls can actually go ahead and do using whatever language or technology we want. And then the cool thing you can also do just to make this sort of uh, infinity base is I've noticed, check that out. Uh, <laughs> woo! It's creepy. Uh, it's really creepy. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, so a little bit in terms of um, you know, the types of things that you can do. And you know, again, I think the cool thing about this, uh, as you think about AI, again, is you know, the, there's different degrees of power you can leverage when you start thinking about machine learning and AI. Um, you know, to get the ultimate power, you are going to want to need to spend time and learn sort of really the, the science behind AI and you know, some of the core concepts around statistical analysis and data science. Uh, and so it's, you know, if you want to do the ultimate, it is going to require that uh, you invest time in learning it. But the cool thing is, you know, for the rest of us, and I put myself in the rest of us category, uh, you know, I think you're gonna find also AI is gonna be something that you're just gonna take advantage of very naturally in the same way that you reference a library inside your applications or a framework inside your applications and leverage it today. And so definitely ex recommend exploring ways that you can start to integrate you know, this type of uh, intelligence inside your systems because it really does make uh, building apps more fun. And as an end user, uh, you know, you can be a real delighter uh, in terms of the experience you put in front of people. So that's one of the kind of things that uh, um, yeah, I, I think with cloud computing is going to become just more pervasive in terms of all the systems that we're building. You know, the other one that I think is, is a pretty hot topic right now is around serverless computing. And, you know, new ways for us to even sort of execute code uh, in a cloud-based environment that doesn't require us to have fixed servers or fixed uh, infrastructure that's up and running, but instead allows us to really schedule code that can execute on demand uh, based on events or triggers uh, within our application that we fire. And there's a couple of reasons, you know, things that I think are compelling about this. You know, one is it really changes the economics of how we can build apps. Um, I like to tell the story of, you know, one of our um, customers that's a big manufacturer doing industrial things, and they were doing a test uh, with serverless computing. Uh, on Azure, and they basically pumped about a billion events uh, in a day um, through the system. And thankfully it worked well, and then they tried to figure out, okay, how much is this gonna cost us? And they got the bill, and they called us up on the phone, and they basically said, your billing system's broken, uh, because it says it's, it's $40 um, for this billion events. And we thought, you're right, our system's broken, our billing system's broken, and we kind of dived in and looked at the bill and came back to them and realized, no, actually, that is really the price. Uh, it really is only forty dollars to spend this, you know, this billion dollars of IoT events, and they kind of went, "Yay!" Uh, we went, eh. uh, <laughs> and you know, but it, but it, it just you know blew their mind in terms of like this is possible because we would have thought we'd need you know hundred servers, you know, basically allocated and costing thousands of dollars to do this, and you know it suddenly changed the way that they were able to think about uh, computing logic on top of the data that they were gathering in radically new ways. And I think you know, one of the things that you're gonna see, and I'll show some demos in a minute, uh, is this sort of marriage of AI plus serverless together, such that you can actually trigger off serverless code in response to 
data changes or user input changes inside your system, uh, and be able to you then run AI algorithms asynchronously in a serverless way to actually understand and actually reason over that data in deeper ways. And the ability to do that easily at scale and then cheaply really changes how you build applications in new ways. And you know, on, on, you know, a lot of things that we're doing, for example, in Azure is how do we make it easy to do this in response to lots of different events? And so we have um, an ability now to run code. Uh, again, asynchronously, you don't pay for any, anything up front. You really only pay for the clock cycles that you're executing and trigger in response to lots of different things. So an HTTP request coming in or a timer going off every five seconds or a storage change or a database change uh, or even things like you know, a CRM record changing in Salesforce or Dynamics, or an IoT event, uh, or you know, a tweet coming in through the internet. And the ability to kind of you know, be able to respond to any of those types of events, schedule code, and have it execute, um, you know, ends up being really cool. And we have a service we call our Azure Function Service. Uh, and you know, every cloud has you know, the equivalent kind of serverless service. Um, you know, some nice things that we have about our Azure Functions is lets you write in any language. Um, and you can do everything in the browser, which I'll show in a second. Um, but it also has really rich development tool support. And so you can actually execute and debug it locally. Uh, and you, know, you can actually package up this code so it's not just sort of snippets of code, but can be real application logic uh, that you can develop using your language or tool of choice uh, and be able to edit and manage it in a rich way. So let's go ahead and walk uh, through a couple you know, fun use cases of serverless to kind of just illustrate what you can do with it. How many people here have used serverless before, or built a serverless app? Okay, good number of hands, good. Um, so you know, let, me, let me start with hello world for people that haven't, and then we'll show off a little bit some more advanced stuff uh, that's pretty fun. Um, and so you know, again, for Azure, it's pretty easy. You basically just say, I want to create a new serverless function app, and um, uh, you know, we stand up uh, sort of an environment that looks like this. Uh, where you can basically code inside the browser if you want to and, and basically register events. Uh, and this is often, sorry, I'd say the easiest way to get started. Um, I'm one of those people that eventually doesn't want to program in a text box uh, inside a web page. I'd much rather be able to use an editor of my choice, um, which is why we also have the rich tooling support. So I'm going to show off just a few Hello World demos using the browser since it's really easy and you don't need to install anything. And then for the more advanced demo, I'll flip over and I'll use Visual Studio uh, with a little bit richer code uh, to show that experience off as well. And so, you know, basically what you can do inside here is very easily say, I want to go ahead and uh, create a function. Ooh, assuming the internet works. There we go. Um, and basically we have a bunch of triggers uh, that are kind of predefined templates that you can use to go ahead and um, schedule code. So you can say, for example, every time an HTTP request comes in or a timer goes off um, or something gets put on a queue, et cetera, and, and you know, there's hundreds of templates and you can create and publish your own. And so I'm just gonna create a very simple one here, um, which is an HTTP event. And so I can choose the language I want. So I can do Python, I can do JavaScript, I can do Java, um, et cetera. I'm just gonna use C Sharp here and I can go ahead and just say, Call this the NDC, HTTP trigger. And when I do this, it's gonna go ahead and create for me, um, you know, again, simple text box with a little bit of sample code here on how to do kind of the equivalent sort of hello world uh, like scenario. And I can either just hit this directly or I can go ahead and hit run, in which case I'll get sort of interactive logging experience. And then I can just take the URL to this function we created, paste it in the browser. And by default right now, it's just gonna spit back and say, you know, please pass the name on the query string of the request body. And that's because the code, uh, if you look at it, basically just says, if there's nothing coming in on the query string called name, spit out, please pass it. Otherwise, if you supply the value return okay and say hello name. And so if we said here, whoops, go back here and say name equals NDC. See, spits back hello NDC. And the cool thing again is just the fact that I'm not spinning up a VM, I'm not paying for anything that's sort of sitting idle as I'm doing this. Um, you know, instead, I'm literally just paying based on the invocations uh, that are coming in um, as part of it. Uh, and it looks like, oh, cool, some other people in the audience have found it. Um, uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, and you go from there. So this is sort of super simple 
run some code in response to an HTTP event. Let's look at something a little bit richer. So, you know, how many people, you know, you might say, well, what can you do with just running code on an HTTP event? Why is this at all better um, for different things? You know, the place where I think serverless ends up being sort of really compelling is for things that don't happen all the time, but happen asynchronously or, you know, occasionally uh, in particular is where the economics makes a ton of sense for serverless. Uh, and so, for example, you want to process an order that's put into a queue uh, for an e-commerce site. You might not need to do that every second. You might only do five orders per minute. Serverless makes a ton of sense to be able to schedule that code uh, reactively in a really fast way. You know, other cases where I think you're going to see serverless used a lot more is with things like webhooks and the ability to kind of compose different applications together, including SaaS and other cloud services built by others, uh, and be able to kind of stitch them together so that you can get a notification when, say, your CRM app has a record change or when, um, you know, uh, uh, something happens in a social media app and then be able to kind of asynchronously schedule code based on it. So how many people here today have ever used a webhook? technique in order to actually kind of enrich their app. Okay, so maybe 10%, 15% of people. Um, how many people here use GitHub? Okay, a lot more hands. Uh, so GitHub has rich webhook support, so you can actually uh, wire up webhooks to any GitHub repository. Um, and so what I thought I'd do is just actually show off a super simple scenario where, hey, let's actually, uh, for everyone that's using GitHub, you know, how can you actually write some code in response to GitHub data changes and you know, enrich your GitHub-based workflows um, a little bit and basically not have to pay pretty much anything to do it. So what I'm going to do to do this is I'm going to create a new function. And um, uh, yeah, one of the templates I'm going to use here is a function called a GitHub webhook. Um, and so I could call this, again, I could write it in different languages. Um, and you know, this is going to create, again, super simple little app here. Uh, it's four lines of code. Um, and obviously, you'd make it a lot richer if you wanted to. Uh, but it's just going to basically, by default, spit out to the log from GitHub. Here was the message that came in. Um, so again, not, not super rich. Um, and what it exposes here in the top right is two little things, which is a function URL. So in other words, the HTTP URL to invoke this code. And then also a GitHub secret, which is just basically we just pre-populated if you click it, you see it, but since I don't really want to share my GitHub secret with all of you, um, no offense, um, trust me, when you click it, you get something like that, but that's just the URL. Um, and what I can basically do now is just take this and go into GitHub. And so this is just standard GitHub here. Um, I can click on, let's say, a repository I have. If you go to settings, um, yeah, one of the things that's there on the left is called webhooks. Um, and so if you never added a webhook to GitHub before, it's pretty easy. Um, all you do is you paste in the URL of, uh, that you want them to call in response to an event happening. You paste in that secret feed uh, key uh, right there. Um, you do want to make sure you, you pass the right content format. So I think our template defaults to JSON, but you just want to make sure you select the right one that matches the template in terms of how you parse the values. And then you can effectively say, have them uh, forward everything to me, or you can basically select individual events inside GitHub. So if you just wanted to know and say someone posted an issue uh, to, your, to your project, just click the issues one, and then they'll call that URL only in response to issues occurring. So super simple uh, kind of approach, um, just so you don't have to watch me or you, you can't watch me paste in my secret. I just created one earlier uh, that points to that, but I use basically that approach in order to do it. Um, and uh, you know, again, this is the, the same default template that I had where I'm just spitting out the value of GitHub. And so now if I run this, um, oh look, other people have already found this. Um, huh. Cool, isn't that fun? Um, it's gonna be even more interesting with the next demo. Um, so I just go to the issues list here and uh, go ahead and if I want to, um, hello NDC. Ah, yeah, I, know, I know it is. Uh, hello, back. Uh, and I can post this. Um, and basically what I'll find if I go back in the browser here is GitHub saw an issue was posted, saw it we had registered a webhook, called my URL, this code executed, and then just spat back in the command line, you know, get hello back. Uh, and so, you know, that's how easy it is to kind of do this wire up of integration 
you know, pretty much with anything that exposes a webhook. And since most SaaS apps out there now expose webhooks, um, you, know, you can now do lots of simple integration scenarios really easily. And the beauty here is, let's say, for example, I have a horrendous project on GitHub and I get hundreds of thousands of issues uh, that are submitted you know, every month on it. You know, I'm probably going to pay for, I don't know, six pence worth of compute uh, to be able to execute the responding serviceless code uh, to basically get notified. Um, and so again, it's a super cost effective way that uh, for effectively nothing, I can now integrate my systems into other systems and start to build more interesting end-to-end -end scenarios. So this is all kind of hello world default template stuff. Um, and you know, right now I'm not integrating any AI, um, obviously into these apps, but I could obviously call those same AI algorithms easily within this code. And so what I want to do is now show like an even sort of slightly richer app uh, where instead of developing everything in a text box uh, in a browser, um, yeah, I want to be able to kind of write uh, a little bit more, more um, rich code in whatever editor or tool of my choice. So in this case here, I've got a um, Visual Studio project that I've created. Uh, if you're using VS and .NET today, um, we actually have kind of a nice Azure function project that you can just go ahead and create. Um, this puts all the right files in there, but it also kind of wires up a local emulator as well as debugging and publishing experience so that you can also easily um, work with it locally without having to kind of upload code continuously in the cloud. And what I'm going to run here, let me just kick this off, uh, is sort of a fun, silly app, uh, which is a cat moderator app. Um, and basically what this site is, is you know, it's a standard sort of content mod, uh, upload site where you can upload pictures of your cat. Um, is anyone here a cat person? A few people are. Um, I'm more of a dog person, but someone built the cat site for me, so it's, it's, a, it, it's a fun demo. You can substitute whatever content you want in it. Um, and basically, you, know, you can go ahead and upload a picture. Uh, so let's you know, go ahead and say, cute cat. It uploads it. Um, and the way this works is it uploads it, and it's putting it in what's called a pending state. So instead of this going live for the whole world to see, what I want to do is, since people can upload arbitrary content, is make sure this really is a picture of a cat uh, and that you know, someone can't go ahead and uh, potentially upload something inappropriate or something that isn't specific to the site. And what I have here is the serverless code that's running in the background to do this moderation. And so basically what just fired here in the debugger uh, is an event that I'd wired up not in response to the actual HTTP post, so it's not an HTTP event. Instead, I've wired it up so that anytime data changes in my database, I want this code to asynchronously execute. And so it's basically running in the back end, and again, only firing when something gets uploaded. And what this basically is doing is just calling off to those same cognitive services I talked about earlier in AI, and it's gonna do effectively image and content moderation. And so it, it, this is sort of the, the code to basically invoke um, those cognitive services. And it's basically uploading the image to the cognitive service and saying, bring back to me human readable version of what's in this picture. And you can see here, broken in the debugger, this caption here. And this wasn't the caption I entered as the user uploading my picture. This is what came back from the AI algorithm, which is this is a picture of a black cat sitting on a bed. Um, and I can then basically say, okay, if there's a cat in the picture, great, approve it. Um, it also checks the uh, caption uh, that, was, that the user specified. I said cute cat. Uh, it's, there's a sort of profanity checker or appropriateness checker on the, uh, on the text. And so if someone also uploads something inappropriate, I can go ahead and um, remove it. And since right now, this picture contains a cat and the text passes the moderation, I can go ahead and hit continue. And um, it approves the picture. And if I come back here and hit refresh, on the approve page, you can see the cat's there. And this is cool because other people are now uploading their own pictures. <laughs> this is where it gets scary. Um, but a brown and white dog. So cool thing is, my suspicion is this is not someone's pet cat. Um, it's a brown and white dog. Uh, and so I'm going to hit continue. Oh, a cat lying in a desk in front of a computer. Oh, lots of people have found it. Awesome. Um, <laughs> And you know the saving grace is close-up of a cat. 
Yeah, more dogs. Uh, anyway, before it's dangerous, let's just go ahead and refresh. Um, uh, but you can see, there we go. Uh, who's, who owns Deus in here? Thank you. Oh, OK. Um, I'm not sure whose that one is, but it is a cat, and it is sitting at the desk in front of the computer. Yeah. Um, and so you can see also why it approved it. Uh, and then we can look at the rejected ones. <laughs> Do I click it or not? Uh, there we go. There we go. And so you can see here, this is a brown and white dog. Um, I don't know who uploaded that one, but thank you um, for demonstrating and not doing anything too bad. Um, but anyway, so sim again, simple example of just sort of wiring up here, you know, the, this, this sort of serverless code that fires in response to data that can then use AI and execute that. And again, the beauty thing, beautiful thing about an app like this, um, you're doing it in the past would be hard uh, because you wouldn't necessarily have those AI algorithms to be able to use. You'd have to have, you know, some human go in and do it, and the picture would take forever to go up. Uh, and it would probably be, from an architecture perspective, you'd have a VM or two for your front end, you'd have a VM for the back end processing, the VM in the back end would mostly sit idle, or you'd have a daemon that would be hard to scale out, et cetera. And in this case here, you know, again, unless you have a ton of cats, uh, you know, the overall cost of running the back end in this case is probably going to be you know, less than a penny uh, for something simple like this a month. Uh, and then if the site got really popular, you know, the beautiful thing about serverless computing is it, it pushes us in a pattern where we actually end up coding our applications uh, in an event-driven way, which makes it much more in scalable from an architecture perspective. And so if I literally had a million events come in simultaneously, I could actually schedule a million functions to execute simultaneously, and I wouldn't need to scale out my infrastructure manually. You know, the cloud's just going to basically take care of that for us um, and give us that flexibility. So. Um, you know, lots of scenarios here, and since I'm scared about what else anyone's going to do, I'm going to stop showing pictures of, of uh, approved pending stuff um, and talk about some more serverless stuff that we can take advantage of. So the stuff I showed here um, uh, in that cat demo, you know, was, was really sort of showing off, um, you know, how you can write custom code in a serverless way. And you know, obviously, being able to write custom code gives us sort of ultimate flexibility in terms of the logic that we ultimately want to execute. And you know, you know, if you can, for example, debug it locally, and if you if you can add any number of files and libraries to your serverless code, you know, anything you can do today programmatically inside your applications, you can now run serverlessly. At the same time, I think you know one of the things like even that GitHub sample kind of shows off is, you know. It gets super powerful when you can also, rather than have to write procedural code for everything, you know, can you take advantage of some of the data extensibility that different applications have uh, and be able to kind of leverage also kind of more of a composition model of data or app connectors that enable you to more easily stitch together solutions end to end. And you know, I think you know, one of the things that we're also trying to do and, and um, uh, have a nice uh, service to, to enable is kind of these declarative workflows where, that you can make, there's some, sometimes very long running, that could be multi-day workflows, uh, where you can leverage pre-built data and app connectors that do a lot of the grunge work for you of extracting data from this system and passing it along to a different system, and being able to do that with security and reliability and everything built in. Uh, and the nice thing with our, our Logic App service is you can leverage these built-in connectors, and I'll show you some demos in just a second, but you can also then drop in your own connectors using the same approach that I just showed uh, with these Azure functions, where you write your own custom code. And so you have the flexibility of both pre-built connectors, but also the ability to write your own code uh, that you can go ahead and execute. So let me show you what that looks like and means. So uh, I'm going to show off, oops, right button. I'm going to show off a um, uh, sort of a service that, that we've actually been running ourselves on our team that we found super useful, uh, which is an example of one of these logic apps. Um, and so you can just go new logic app to create one. Um, this is one I have sort of pre-built. And basically what this service does is it is automatically um, scanning for social media feedback on Twitter and serverlessly executing workflows every time a tweet comes in that matches a certain criteria. And it does a couple different things. And so you can kind of see 
the logic here, expand it. Um, and you can kind of use this sort of declarative connector model to stitch this together. And so I'm using a built-in uh, Twitter uh, component. And so it's basically just searching for the hashtag Azure every 15 seconds uh, on um, Twitter. And then we have kind of a fire hose access to the Twitter feed. So it, it basically every time there's a new tweet that comes in, uh, we'll kick off a workflow. And then what I'm basically doing here, and you can see this is again where we can weave in AI, similar to what we did in the last demo, is I can call off to a sentiment detection AI algorithm that's in cognitive services that's gonna basically, given a chunk of text, come back and tell me on a scale of zero to one, is the content in here positive or negative in tone? Um, you know, so similar to that face detection where I was frowning and sad, you know, it'll try, so try to statistically understand it. And then I'm using another built-in connector where I'm calling out to actually extract out from this block of text, what are the key phrases that stand out? And how can I build a model so that as I can actually train based on a set of text, what are the things that people are talking about? And then I basically pass in this into an Azure function. So this is a place where I'm basically taking a bunch of this custom code and I wanna synthesize it in, in an in a, a, a additional way. Um, I could do it declaratively, but in this case here, it's just easier to write Java or C Sharp or Python code to do that. And so this is just gonna call out to one of these Azure functions and execute it, just like you saw me do earlier. Uh, and then I'm basically gonna pump this into a Power BI data set. So I can actually visualize uh, what this tweet data looks like. And I'm gonna basically put into this data set the tweet text, the score on sentiment, where it was tweeted, who created it, and what the key phrases are. And then, since I wanna make sure if someone's upset, I'm gonna basically uh, wire up here uh, some logic that says if the sentiment score is less than 0.3, meaning if we think the user is upset, uh, I'm gonna basically pump this into a Microsoft Teams room, which is sort of like a Slack channel where all my engineers can basically see the tweet directly. And then I can open up a support case in our CRM system uh, that someone can then go ahead and reach out to that customer to help them. And these are all kind of built-in connectors. And the beautiful thing is, you know, you can leverage these built-in connectors so you can just sort of drag and drop these and wire them up for lots of different scenarios uh, because different SaaS apps, frankly, implement REST and implement security in different ways. So if I want to integrate with Marketing Cloud, I can use Adobe or Facebook, we have connectors, or Google, we have connectors, or DocuSign or Dropbox or AWS or Gmail or, you know, you name it, uh, MailChimp. You know, these, these are all built-in connectors, uh, Salesforce, et cetera, Slack. Um, you can also go ahead and connect on-premises. So if you've got an SAP system, that's your ERP system, or you've got an on-prem Oracle or SQL database, you can also wire up these things declaratively. And what this thing now does, once I hit save, is it's now running serverless code. So I'm not having to pay for you know, a server workflow that's running around. Instead, I think I pay for every million invocations uh, of this workflow. Um, and I think for every million steps, it's something like, I think, 15 pounds uh, worth of usage. So you can run a lot of these steps uh, for very little, if nothing, uh, at all. And you know, in terms of what this looks like then, and this is always scary because this is real Twitter data, um, you can basically see here are all the tweets that have happened in the last sort of hour or so um, across the world on Azure and all the locations for them. Uh, you can basically see our sentiment chart of what actually people are saying about Azure from our AI model in terms of positive or negative. Um, again, 0.5 is neutral, which is sort of the default, which is why you see uh, you know, heavy uh, base there, but you can see the good news is people are mostly pretty happy. Um, and then you can also see here, you know, what are the key phrases that people are talking about? So I think I was in uh, Munich yesterday talking about our Azure Kubernetes service, and you can see well, someone liked it, um, and that had a perfect sentiment score that they thought it was great, and then these are all the key phrases uh, that have been pulled out of all these different tweets and their relative sentiment score. So this gives us a nice heads-up display. And if you remember from the logic perspective, we said if it's negative though, we wanna know about it. And so if it's negative, pump it into a channel that all my engineers can look at and open up a support case. And so this is where it gets dangerous. Um, so these are all the negative tweets about Azure. Um, uh, people have said, and you know, sometimes it's just hard, I don't know, the latest .NET community daily, I'm not sure why that was negative, but um, you know, it's, it's hard with AI with a short amount of text sometimes to get it completely right. Uh, this is a lot better when you have a paragraph of text. Um, so there's a lot of you know, things here where I sort of say it's not really negative, it's just neutral. Uh, but this is one that is actually uh, uh, looks bad or real, which is, hey, I'm getting a rate limit per day in my Grafana 
dashboard when trying to access the data from application insights. And so, yeah, this is someone who either has misconfigured something or maybe hasn't actually scaled their, their thing up. And this is, yeah, they're having a problem. The nice thing now is my team can know about it literally in real time. Um, so that tweet happened, you know, 15 minutes ago or less. Uh, and, you know, we can reach out and actually help them on Twitter uh, without having to wait for them to open a support case, without the, waiting for them to get even more angry after a couple hours of them not being able to figure out how to do it. Uh, and we can close the loop in an easy way. Um, and, you know, we actually use this for real in Azure. We actually have a team that watches 24-7. And our average response time when someone posts something negative on Twitter uh, is today 3.5 minutes before we actually reach out to them. Uh, and we'll direct message a support case. So that's a really good way if you want to get a free support ticket, actually. Um, um, and, you know, again, it, it's amazing the feedback that people get when you actually help them that way. Uh, and so this, you know, really does actually drive business value in terms of how we use it. Um, and then the nice thing is, again, from a serverless perspective, it's easy to whip one of these things together. How do you know if it actually is working? Uh, and so what this actually gives you is a way to actually monitor all of the workflows that are executing. And so if I see a false positive or I want to understand why did this workflow kick off the way it did, you know, I can basically uh, click on any of the individual um, tweets here. And so you know, I can actually see um, I don't know, someone, it's like a marketing message. Um, sentiment came back 0.93, um, so it sounds, they're thrilled, so I guess they're happy. Uh, you know, here are the key phrases, IoT extension, Azure CLI, et cetera, and then, you know, you can see it didn't notify the Teams room because we thought the sentiment was positive. And so, simple, easy way, I can actually see how much time in terms of seconds. You can see for most of these things, it was, you know, under a second to execute this particular workflow basically means I didn't pay pretty much anything to do it. So again, simple way to kind of integrate serverless in another way into your apps. Uh, and again, be able to kind of start to um, build even richer systems as a result. So I talked about AI, I talked about serverless. I had one more trend I, was, I thought I'd talk about in terms of as we think about modern cloud and what you can do going forward, which is really, you know, this, this uh, change that's happening, which is the, the fact that we can now build systems that are truly global uh, that can now interact with everything. Um, you know, using IoT, everything will have an IP address going forward. That we can reach to everyone's pocket with a cell phone or a smartphone uh, or new types of wearable experiences they have. And you know, that starts to put new challenges on all of us as developers for how the heck do we manage all this data? How do we actually reason over that data? How do we scale that data? And in a world where our users are no longer just in the country that we're in, but they're in Australia, they're in the US, they're in Asia, they're in Africa, they're all over the world. You know, how do you build an apps at planet scale? And really, how do you manage the data in those apps at planet scale and do it in a robust, reliable way? Um, and you know, that's gonna put new pressures on all of our architectures and all the systems that we use um, as developers. And there's no silver bullet, so I'm gonna talk about some of the stuff that we're doing to make this easier, but also recognize this isn't just like you flip a switch and it works, um, but the more that we can leverage in the cloud systems that help us towards that journey, um, you know, the more we're gonna be able to build even richer and cooler apps. And you know, one of the things that we've been hard at work at, um, and I think there's been some talks here at the event, uh, is you know, a, a new database system we call Cosmos DB, um, which is kind of the sort of uh, the first really globally distributed what we call multi-model database service uh, that can help uh, as part of this. And basically the way Cosmos DB is designed is, you know, unlike a traditional relational database where you kind of pick the place where you want to run it and that's where it runs, um, it's really designed so that you can actually run it at a global level and actually run it and scale it out across multiple regions in the cloud. And so we have 42 regions across the world, so those are data center regions, two of them in the UK here. Um, and so I can actually configure uh, where all my data will be present. So I can say I want it in Australia, I want it here in Europe, I want it in North America, South America, and Asia. Uh, and then anytime you write data into Cosmos DB, it will put it in all of those different locations and it'll keep it coordinated and in sync. And we'll talk about from a transaction perspective, even give you the ability to coordinate transactions at the consistency level you want uh, to be able to access that data. And that then means that you can have an instance of your app, say the front end or the API layers in each of those regions. So you can provide super, super fast latency to your customers. Uh, against that data, and then know that if that customer hops on a plane and goes to Europe, they'll still have super fast latency, 
because your DNS will send them to the Europe region uh, instead of the Australia region, and they're still hitting the same data that they've saved in Australia uh, at single digit millisecond response time. So that gives you kind of the global nature. Um, you know, what's nice also about a system like this is it's really designed to be able to, again, support and handle lots of different types of data, uh, ranging from a few gigabytes in size uh, to literally uh, multiple petabytes in size, and from being able to do, say, 100 transactions per second to be able to scale up to over 10 million transactions per second. Uh, we actually have a couple customers that are now at the 10 million transactions per second range uh, in terms of how they're using the system. And in fact, one of our retailers for Black Friday um, uh, in November uh, scaled up to manage 100 trillion transactions in a single day. Um, and I actually thought that was a typo because uh, I'd never heard of 100 trillion transactions in a day. Um, but that's, you know, that's the type of system where when you want to have uh, rich AI running, you want to have rich analytics, and you want to be able to do rich curation of your customer and product data, you know, that's the, like the level you'll do if you really operate at a global scale. Uh, and then, you know, one of the things that we do with Cosmos DB, which is nice, is provide not just an availability SLA, meaning like the system stays up, but also SLAs around performance latency and around performance throughput. It's one thing to say you can scale to 100 trillion transactions, but it, does it actually perform at that level and perform within certain uh, performance characteristics? And so one of the things that's nice about Cosmos DB is it guarantees single digit millisecond response time uh, for all your operations uh, at the 99th percentile. So meaning 99% of all operations are guaranteed to complete in single digit millisecond response time or you get money back. Um, and that gives you kind of a scaling point that you can architect around, again, very large systems. Uh, and that's true also for performance throughput and consistency. And then lastly, the cool thing here is it's not like a new programming model you have to learn. You get to choose the programming model you already know and be able to take advantage of it. So if you're a MongoDB uh, developer today, you can point your existing MongoDB code and libraries against it. You don't need to install a new library. It's binary compatible with the MongoDB protocol. The same is true for Spark, for Gremlin, for uh, example, um, uh, graph-based systems. Uh, and then we also just recently released Cassandra support in preview. Uh, so you can basically program against this type of system at a global scale, uh, again, using any Cassandra code that you already have. And then the cool thing is, and this is sort of how it ties all the stuff together, the AI, the serverless, and now this, is you know, when you can actually um, store infinite amounts of data, when you can handle millions of updates per second on that data, and then if you can go ahead and execute serverless code in response to any of those data changes, where you can write arbitrary logic against uh, asynchronously any of those uh, data updates, and then be able to integrate AI into it, then you really have the power and the ability to kind of understand your data, your customers, and your scenarios at a level that was never possible before, and be able to design for a footprint and an architecture that can support literally billions of users around the world interacting and hitting your system. Uh, and you know, this is one of the nice things that's now integrated is the fact that you can kind of stitch together this data, stitch together the serverless, and then again, be able to integrate AI uh, throughout the mix. Um, a, I don't know if anyone from ASOS here, actually? There's a, uh, they're, they're busy working on features, I guess. Um, they're a great company that's based here in the UK and um, have been a, a big Azure uh, customer and a, a wonderful partner of ours. And um, you know, I have a nice video from them talking about some of the ways that they've been approaching uh, the ASOS.com retail experience. They're using Cosmos DB, they're using Azure, and they're really pushing the boundaries of what you can do in AI. And so I'll just play a quick video and we'll show another demo um, in terms of, kind of you know, how they're trying to approach it and how they're thinking about it. ASOS wants to be the number one fashion destination for 20-somethings around the world. You know, fashion is in our DNA. We have just over 12 million active customers, over 800 brands, and introducing about four to 5,000 new products onto the site every single week. We don't have shops. People know about ASOS from the internet. We have one minute when that digital platform is out. We're not serving our customers. We want to be there for our customers 24 by 7, 365 days of the year. When you have 85,000 products in your product range, it's vital to have a personalized consumer experience. We took a couple of big decisions early. The first was to go microservice, and the second was to go Azure Platform as a Service. We're using advanced machine learning techniques to synthesize custom and product characteristics to create data sets that will allow us 
to rank product relevance in milliseconds. And what that will mean for our customers is if we're gonna show products they might like, those will be more relevant, the experience will be more relevant. And clearly, this is all about maximizing the sales from the time the consumer shops with us. We're using Cosmos DB because it allows us to distribute the data models to be near the services wherever in the world they're deployed. We like the uh, immediate elasticity. We like the very low latency for random reads. And Azure has delivered as a rock solid platform to create a, an ever more compelling consumer experience. Let's go ahead and walk through kind of, you know, the sort of uh, Cosmos DB experience and, and um, in particular, how do you, you know, leverage kind of data at planet scale and, and build systems that can, can uh, do really interesting things. And so this is a simple uh, example uh, that I was going to show here. Uh, and it's sort of like a content site, so it's comic wiki. Uh, who here likes Marvel Comics? Safe question at a developer event. I have to talk in Canary Wharf on Monday, and I'm not sure how that answer is going to go down. Uh, with uh, a bunch of bankers, but um, you know, so this is again sort of simple site. It's like Wikipedia. You know, it's got a lot of content in it um, uh, about uh, Marvel characters, um, which and there's obviously a graph, which we'll talk about in a second, in terms of how Marvel characters are uh, represented. Uh, and then uh, the other thing we have, let me just make sure it's running, um, is sort of a chat bot here. And so if I wanted to ask, for example, Tony Stark here, who are your friends? Um, I could do it, it could bring back uh, people. If I want to know, for example, you know, who are your uh, enemies, um, uh, who are, let's say, your enemies that work for Hydra, it brings those back. And you know, the interesting thing about kind of building a chat-like system here uh, where you're basically asking arbitrary questions is you know, it, the data model doesn't always lend itself well uh, the relational data model often doesn't lend itself well to answering these types of questions because it very it much is I'm asking about not just information of entities, but also kind of the social interaction experience and the relationships and hierarchy between these entities. And you know what a lot of social networks have found is you know using a graph-based data model works a lot better in those types of scenarios. But kind of, I can ask friend to friends who are also joined and intersected across different parts of the graph. And that's sort of how this system here was built. Um, and you know the code in it is uh, was written in in this case Node.js, um, and um, it is uh, you know using a uh, popular um, graph AP, uh, syntax called Gremlin, uh, and in fact just using the vanilla Gremlin npm package uh, to actually connect to the data data and actually perform these types of queries. And so you know from this Node.js app's perspective, this is just a Gremlin uh, database. Uh, you know, what's cool is we're able to build this Gremlin database using something like Cosmos DB and take advantage of kind of those planet scale capabilities. Uh, and so when I go ahead and create a new system here, I can just go and, um, you know, just say I want a new Cosmos DB system. Uh, and when I specify, you know, I give it the name and all that stuff. But you can notice I can choose the API I want to program. I can use SQL, I can use Mongo, Cassandra, a table API, or again, this Gremlin graph-based uh, programming model. Um, and I even have multiple programming language or programming models and data models inside my overall database uh, for each table or collection. Um, but you know, again, this allows me to kind of use the data model of my choice as I'm interacting it. And this is, you know, this is um, the Marvel database that I'm using as part of the demo. Um, and so this is already created and populated. And uh, one of the things I'll do is just drill into um, our data explorer experience here. And you can kind of see, uh, I'm just doing a gremlin query against kind of the root uh, of that particular database. And you can kind of see, zoom in a little bit here. Um, you know, here is how that overall, oops, uh, collection of Marvel characters are kind of interacting, again, on the graph level from a relationship perspective, uh, an entity perspective um, across the list. And I can you know, obviously do this inside our management portal like so. Uh, the other thing we do now have um, is sort of the ability, if you want, you can also go ahead and do it in your developer tool choice. So this is on my Mac, uh, this is using VS Code. Um, and so if I wanted to, I could basically um, directly in my development tool, and just so I don't pull down like a petabyte of Marvel character data, um, rather than pull back the full graph, I'm just gonna basically um, 
pull back a little bit around Tony Stark. Um, and so this is basically you know, showing effectively, um, again, the relationships across that graph and um, you know, allow me to work with it directly between my code kind of in a nice integrated way. What's cool though is, is not that I can just store data, because obviously there's many different graph databases out there, but really the fact that I can store it all over the world and now take this Marvel app and basically scale it so that no matter where you are in the world, it's only a few milliseconds to basically get an immediate response back when someone visits or interacts with the app. Uh, and that's sort of the beauty about having sort of this global scale database. And so you can see here, these are all the uh, regions around the world where Cosmos DB is deployed. So these are each Azure regions. And so you can see we have two in the UK. Uh, we've got um, Ireland, we've got Amsterdam, we've uh, uh, got Germany and France coming shortly. We've got three in India, two in Australia, et cetera, et cetera. And everything that has a dark blue right now is where my Marvel database is currently deployed. Um, and so if I wanted to enter, for example, Brazil, I could go ahead and select that. I could hit save. And this would then go ahead and you know, expand my Marvel database to also be present in Brazil with the exact same data, such that if someone in the UK right, makes a right, it'll show up in Brazil um, so that all my Brazil customers will see it simultaneously as well. And I don't need to write any replication data. Basically, the database will do that for me um, and help guarantee uh, it's available everywhere. Uh, and what's nice also is, and, you know, obviously, for anyone that's built a distributed system, you often struggle with the question of, you know, so what happens when you write that transaction in the UK? You know, when is it guaranteed that that data is going to show up, say, in Australia? And there's, a, you know, the challenge with any type of distributed system, especially one that's global, uh, is you can never go faster than the speed of light. And since it takes about uh, a millisecond to go 130 miles of cable, uh, there's no way to instantaneously write a transaction in the UK and in Australia simultaneously that goes faster than the speed of light. And so there's always going to be some delay when you make a write in a distributed system before it can be propagated everywhere. Um, and you know, one of the things that, that, uh, that makes Cosmos a little unique is it gives you uh, the ability as a developer to also choose what is the consistency model you want to have every time you make a write in terms of uh, when the transaction completes in the UK versus when the data shows up in Australia. And so, for example, you can actually choose if you want to have what's called session level consistency, uh, or sorry, strong level consistency, so that the transaction will not commit in the UK until the data also is committed and is available in Australia. That's really good if you're doing financial transactions and you want guaranteed uh, consistency. It also is the downside, though, it's the slowest because, again, it's going to take some period of time to go to Australia and back uh, to commit that transaction. You can't go faster than the speed of light as part of it. You can also do what's called eventual consistency, which says as soon as you write a transaction in the UK, the transaction is completed and your app continues, and then it will eventually replicate the data to Australia and we do have a guaranteed period of time by, by the time it'll be there. Um, that gives you the best performance, but at the same time also means that you don't necessarily guarantee that someone instantaneously in, in Australia will have the correct data. And then we have a nice thing we call session consistency, which frankly is one of the best because it's sort of in between. And that basically says in the UK, as soon as you write that transaction, uh, it's guaranteed to be committed. And then any subsequent connection on that session or using the session token you provide, is guaranteed to always have the committed data, no matter where in the world that it actually operates. Um, but other people that are not looking at that data won't be blocked. Uh, and so it's great for like shopping carts and for other capabilities where you just want to make sure the user, if they hit refresh and they just happen to be bounced to Australia, um, is still going to see the same data and not get confused. But at the same time, you don't have the performance uh, latency of, um, let's say, a, a strong consistency model. So you can choose which consistency model you want uh, with Cosmos DB. Uh, as the default, and then you can also override it on a per transaction basis. So that also means, depending on the scenario in your app, you can also control um, which way it is. And then again, the great thing about Cosmos is uh, you can also then go and monitor how the system's actually being used. Um, and so right now, I'm basically my one demo app hitting it, so we're not really getting hit heavy hard, and hopefully you haven't figured out the URL to it. Um, but if I wanted to, I could measure, again, the throughput, the storage, the latency, and actually see, am I getting that guaranteed single-digit millisecond response time at the 99th percentile? And I can see it on a global level um, throughout the world. So a nice way I can now suddenly replicate that data, and then tying it together to the previous uh, two sections. If I want to, I can then go ahead and say, let's now write serverless code 
so that every time one of those million writes happens, I can actually schedule code in the language of my choice and basically um, you know, run AI models on it, update the code, or update the data model uh, to reflect that, uh, and, and be able to again scale out the system so it is global. Every change can have AI associated with it. And my user experience is lightning fast. Uh, and you know, I think you're gonna see more and more uh, this combination of AI, serverless, and being able to work with data at a truly planet scale become kind of fundamental design points in literally every application uh, that we build going forward. And the cool thing is, it's no longer rocket science to do that. It's no longer something that requires a well-funded startup in order to do. Uh, you can literally uh, get going and, um, you know, with less than 10 pounds a month, actually get that system working such that it could scale to um, around the world uh, and handle that types of millions of load. Or if it doesn't reach that point, you still have a well-architected system that was easy to build. So anyway, so talk a little bit about these sort of three trends, AI, serverless, uh, and uh, uh, planet-scale data. There's obviously a lot more trends uh, that are gonna be emerging as part of the modern cloud. You know, again, as I said at the beginning, this really is the best time, I think, ever to be a developer. Uh, and you know, the fun thing is there's lots of new technology to be able to use and take advantage of. And you know, these events like NDC, it's a fantastic way to kind of get exposure to all that, to really hear how people are practicing uh, those new technologies and um, to learn how you, know, you can build these amazing systems as well. Uh, and if you're interested, you know, all the stuff I showed here uh, is running on Azure today, so there's no like private hidden things that I've, I'm taking advantage of. Um, and um, you know, hope to see uh, some of you experiment with it and learn it. There's a great trial that you can basically try everything out here uh, with uh, uh, over, I think it's about 150 pounds worth of credits for a month. Uh, and so everything you can do here, you can do as part of that. Uh, and then we also now have a perpetual uh, or year-long free trial. And so even after the 150 credits are up, you can use the Cosmos DB database for a year, you can use your serverless functions for a year, and you can use those AI cognitive services for a year uh, and not pay anything uh, and experiment and use some more. So anyway, I hope, I hope regardless of what language, what OS uh, you're using, uh, you get a chance to play around with it, and I look forward to seeing what you're building. So thanks so much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.